All right, it is almost 7.04, so I will start now. Welcome everyone. I'm Sarah Walker, the Walden Woods Projects Education Director. I'm joined with my colleague tonight, Zoe Pollock, who will be mostly working behind the scenes. Uh, thank you everyone at home for joining us for our event with Vital Grounds, Doug Chadwick and Matthew Hart. For those that do not know us, the Walden Woods Project is a nonprofit based out of Lincoln, Massachusetts. We preserve the land, the literature, and legacy of Henry David Thoreau to foster an ethic of environmental stewardship and social responsibility. Our organization was founded in 1990 by recording artist Don Henley, and this past April, we celebrated our 33rd anniversary. Over the past three decades, in partnership with our friends and donors, we have protected over 170 acres of highly threatened land on 14 sites within Walden Woods. We house the world's largest collection of thorough related materials in our library. We also offer a wide range of educational programs for local and global audiences of all ages. Our school group visit sites include the Walden Pond State Reservation, where we are the official friends of Walden Pond, the Walden Woods Project Farm, the Walden Woods Project Library, and Thoreau's Path on Brister's Hill. And this is a Zoom webinar tonight, so you are only able to see the host and the panelists. Please use the chat function at the bottom of your screen if you're having any difficulties and we'll do our best to help you. You can also use the chat to correspond more immediately with each other. And if you would like closed captioning, you can click the live transcript button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And there will be an audience Q&A during the last 15 minutes or so of our event. Please enter any questions throughout in the Q&A box on the bottom of the screen, and we will address them later. And I will now turn the program over to Matt Hart from Vital Ground, who will speak about their organization and introduce tonight's speaker, Doug Chadwick. So now over to you, Matt. Thanks, Sarah. It's great to be with you all tonight. Um, my name is Matt Hart. I am the communications director and uh, resident English major at Vital Ground. So it's uh, very fun to be chatting with such a literary group. Um, we are a land trust based in Missoula, Montana that protects wildlife habitat. Um, and yeah, we're, we're thrilled to be kind of co-hosting tonight um, to hear Doug Chadwick talk about his book, Four Fifths Grizzly, uh, which explores how we're all intrinsically connected to the natural world. And many of the messages uh, that come from Doug's book really underpin Vital Ground's work, which connects people to landscape conservation and habitat protection um, to secure our region's most important wildlife corridors. So just a little bit about Vital Ground, and I'll share my screen for just a couple of photos to help illustrate our work. Um, so Vital Ground, like I said, is a land trust. Um, we're based in Missoula, Montana, and we protect and connect habitat for grizzly bears and for all the species that share their range um, in the northern Rocky Mountains. We work primarily with private landowners um, by arranging voluntary conservation agreements to limit development on their properties. Um, and we work closely with local communities as well and fund projects that help prevent conflicts between bears and other wildlife. Uh, since 1990, Vital Ground has permanently protected 54 properties on nearly 10,000 acres and formed partnerships that have helped conserve close to a million acres. We're right around 950,000. Our current focus is on protecting the most important private lands in wildlife corridor areas that help connect the Northern Rockies wild strongholds from Yellowstone National Park and the greater Yellowstone ecosystem up through Montana and Idaho uh, over the border to Canada. Um, so this year, we are working on eight diverse projects in Montana and Idaho. Um, one is our largest conservation easement ever, which you can see in this photo. Uh, it's a 4,500 acre agreement to uh, limit development and employ conservation practices on a, a ranch in central Montana along the Rocky Mountain Front region. Uh, it's where grizzly bears follow the Teton River and one of its main tributaries out of the mountains and out 
toward the plains. Um, so it's a really important area to maintain strings of protected connected habitat so bears don't end up in people's backyards. Um, we're working on another smaller easement that protects wildlife habitat as well as indigenous cultural resources a little farther west in Montana on the Flathead Reservation, which is home to the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. We have uh, several other projects and key wildlife corridors that we're currently working on conserving as well, um, including some that are near existing highway crossing structures uh, that further help wildlife move around the larger landscape. To zoom out a little bit, uh, these projects are part of our regional conservation vision. Um, the Northern Rockies is one of the most intact remaining wildlife communities in the world. It's still got its nearly its full suite of, you know, pre-colonial wildlife from grizzly bears to native trout to wolverine and Canada lynx. Um, in response, though, to the accelerating impacts of our warmer, drier world and the intense real estate pressures that the Mountain West has faced in recent years, um, Vital Ground has launched what we call our One Landscape Initiative. It's a strategic approach um, to prioritize um, habitat corridors and conservation efforts in those corridors in order to connect the region's wild strongholds um, so that wildlife have greater connectivity and ability to adapt to change. Um, we formed the One Landscape Initiative after meeting with more than 60 wildlife biologists from state, tribal, federal agencies um, and mapping out the key um, areas for private land conservation that helps connect these wild strongholds. Think of a valley bottom with mountain ranges on either side. And out here in the West, those mountain ranges are typically public land, national forest land, but the valley bottom has a patchwork of private ownerships. So putting some of those private properties into conservation allows wildlife to move across the valley bottom more safely and connect the wild strongholds on either side. So the One Landscape Initiative prioritizes 188,000 acres um, in these different key locations. Um, and we're, uh, we're working very hard to knock out projects as quickly as we can um, because the world's changing and the uh, you know iconic animals that call these places home inspire us to uh, do the best we can as quickly as we can. Um, and that leads me to Doug Chadwick, who's uh, been an inspiration for Vital Ground for quite a long time. Um, he's been a trustee at Vital Ground since our early days in the 1990s and an instrumental force um, in, in shaping our work and, and inspiring it. Um, Doug is currently actually on hiatus from our board while serving as an advisor, but we're assured he'll be back uh, in full trustee capacity soon. Um, beyond his work with Vital Ground, Doug's a wildlife biologist. He's an author, a photographer. He's a frequent contributor to National Geographic. Uh, he's written 15 books and more than 200 articles about wildlife and wild places. Um, since 2013, Doug's also served on the advisory board for the Liz Claiborne Art Ortenberg Foundation based in New York. They're a nonprofit that supports wildlife research and collaborative community-based conservation projects around the world. Uh, going back a little farther in Doug's story, he graduated from the University of Washington with a BS in zoology and from the University of Montana with an MS in wildlife biology. After his time at University of Montana, he worked as a research wildlife biologist studying mountain goats and grizzly bears here in Northwest Montana. And then he launched on his literary journey. And I'm glad we all get to share uh, a little piece of that tonight. I hope you enjoy Doug's presentation and find yourself challenged and inspired by it as I always do when I spend time and hear from Doug. Um, his message of interconnectedness 
uh, how we are intrinsically a part of nature is a perspective that we all need to hear and one that demands we each do something to protect the world we share. So thanks, Doug. I'll close out my screen and let you take it away. All right. <laughs> thanks very much. Um, look, this is this is really fun for me because uh, I guess like a lot of people, I I was who end up in biology, end up in conservation. I was pretty strongly influenced by reading Emerson and Thoreau and uh, Margaret Fuller and other transcendental thinkers of the uh, early 19th century. And I've made my pilgrimage to Walden Pond and I've floated down the Sudbury, the Assabet, and the Concord Rivers back there. So um, it's kind of a nice little coming home here. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, I'm going to just start in with my screen, but what I'm going to talk about, well, I'll talk about it as I go. Here we go. Come on out. There we go. Okay. Um, okay. Um, can every, it, this is working, right? You can see it. I'm so happy. We were trying to figure out my uh, share screen technology the other day, and it occurred to me that the solution was I'll I'll just keep working on it. I'll 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 get it right somehow. And and I thought that's kind of like a pygmy coming me and computers. It's like a pygmy coming on a uh satellite controlled drone in the middle of the Congo forest and looking at it and saying, Yeah, I, I think I can get this thing up and running again. Um but anyway, I, I got help. Here we go. I like well, first of all, I have to show you my T-shirt because this is called Bears of the West. And this is my Bear Jordan shirt. Um, I live in Whitefish, Montana, next to Glacier Park. We've got bears in the park, outside the park, in the city limits now and then, both black bears and grizzly bears. And uh, so anyway, you can sell a t-shirt with any kind of bear logo on it in Whitefish, Montana, to the thousands of actually the millions of people now who troop through in search of wildlife adventures in Glacier Park. Um, but bears have always been a sort of an icon for me. And as you can see from the picture, I don't have to go on too much about how they're like us in many ways. I like them because they enforce a bit of humility and they heighten my attention to my surroundings when I'm out in the woods. And that's actually a pretty priceless thing. But what Matt was talking about is there are keystone species. They have a tremendous effect on the whole ecosystem through their digging. That's what those long claws are for. They're not necessarily for predation or that sort of thing. And that muscle humped on their back is for powering the digging. Uh, they can eat up to 70,000 berries, mostly huckleberries, but of all kinds in this, in this area and distribute the seeds through the place. They have an effect as predators. And they are omnivores that work. Sometimes their main food is insects. It's army cutworm moths that gather on the high tailless slopes of our tallest mountains. Um, anyway, like us, they're omnivores. Like some of us, they need refugia where they have a minimum of disturbance. But they, you know, they live 35 years as, as long as that. And they're learning the whole time. They have one of the biggest brains of any carnivore. They're in the carnivore category, even though they're functionally an omnivore. Um, and they operate from the valley bottoms to the mountain tops, cherry picking the best habitats with the most food during the different seasons. And that's why they make a great umbrella species, which Matt was getting at. If you're saving bears, 
if you've protected land that's good enough and wild enough, free enough, rich enough in its food supply for a grizzly bear, you have pretty much got a guarantee that the cutthroat trout and the trumpeter swans and the lynx and the wolverine and elk and deer have all got room and home space that they require. So save grizzlies, save landscapes, save e whole ecosystems. Um, so I'm trying to look at my notes, but I'm going to quit doing that in a minute. But this is the Four Fifths of Grizzly book. This is my most recent one. And I, it's not Four Fifths about grizzlies. And I'm not going to talk Four Fifths about grizzlies. It's Four Fifths about the way we perceive ourselves in relation to nature. And it's because we've got a lot of work ahead, if we're, especially in this era of changing conditions and booming populations, if we want to save nature. But we have to think again, I, I, I believe, about how we define nature in relation to ourselves, what it means. And we haven't done a very good job of that. So I chose Four Fifths a Grizzly, not because I just admire them and the wild country they inhabit, and not just because I wanted to hint that I'm kind of, you know, big and tough or or I'm something of a badass at times or anything like that. I did it because I actually am Four Fifths a Grizzly and Four Fifths every bear out there from polar bears to spectacle bears in South America's Andes to sun bears in the jungles of Southeast Asia. Um, I'm also four-fifths, and so are you, of, well, pick your, pick your favorite animal. One of mine is the snow leopard. But any mammal will do, because we share 80% or more of our genes with every species of mammal. And that's a pretty remarkable figure. They're identical genes. It means we've got the same operating plans for our minds and bodies to that extent. So we're relatives in a, in a way that I think most people don't appreciate. And if you, well, let me go back. If, if you don't see an animal you like here, or you don't particularly see yourself as four-fifths of a particular wild animal, you're 85% identical in your genetics to your family dog, and 86% related to the cattle I'm, I'm looking at outside my window. And you are 98 to 99% identical in your genes to chimpanzees and at least 90 percent most of the other great apes so um that i guess a lot of people probably have heard that figure and thought about it but let me take another look here there's our four-fifths of gri <laughs> my four-fifths relative the grizzly bear up in alaska but the fish the salmon fleeing from it as it proceeds, uh, looks like upstream. Um, we share 50 to 60% of our genes with fish. And most people haven't thought about that particularly, or the fact that we share 30 to 40% of our genes with insects, like these luminous beetles or fireflies, which I envy you in the East for having, because we don't, we, they're very rare out West. So, we share our genes with a whole host of creatures that look alien to most people, but we're still built from the, many of the same the same uh, coding of how to make an animal. Um, and it's kind of out of left field, but we share 24 24 percent of our genes with a wine grape. and 30% with a banana. So <laughs> um, you might want to rethink where we stand in relation to nature in those terms. 
And finally, going smaller and smaller, even though this is how we've been thinking of viruses lately for the last three years or so, 80% um, of the genes we carry are originated from viruses. And what they are is leftover sequences of coding from a previous infection. And I don't mean necessarily one we had, but one, any, any one of our ancestors from especially fish on up to human beings might have experienced and kept some of that coding within its gen genetic material. And one of the uh, viral sequences that we all have uh, helps us get born because it is critical to the formation of the placenta in female uterus. Another one seems to be essential to the formation of long-term memories. So you don't think of viruses as defining us, but they have a role. And so I think I've covered the, covered the spectrum of life and everyone turns out to be, every organism turns out to be uh, uh, to some degree, um, you know, a cousin, 10th cousin, 100th cousin, but um, a relative. And I think it's critical to, let me see what I can get here. Um, Well, it's a fuller picture of who and what we are. And the big questions is, you know, what defines us as human? And I wanted to, instead of calling this book Four Fists of Grizzly, I thought about calling it our greater selves or more than human. But um, because that's really what we are. But I settled on Four Fists of Grizzly just because I, I thought it was kind of made it more real and, and instant to people. They can picture a grizzly bear a lot more easily. So sometimes when I hear someone say, when we're talking about conservation or wildlife in general, um, about save the old growth, save the whales, whatever it is, is, you know, you hear that comment, well, I appreciate what you do, that's great, but, you know, I'm really not all that into nature myself. And um, just don't get that involved. And I go, well, dude, nature is totally into you. You know, no matter what you think and what you've been taught and what you become accustomed to through our languages, our philosophies, our religions, all these barriers we've set up that define humans separately from the rest of nature. It just, there's no, there's no information that justifies that. In fact, all the modern breakthroughs of science and technology and molecular biology are showing us that we're immersed in a web of other life. So um, another way to look at our relationship with nature is, you know, I, I went down the scale of creatures to the very small, to the microbes, but that's okay because I started off my life as a microbe. This is my baby picture, or maybe it could be your baby picture, but it's a fertilized human egg. So I started off as, what was it? Uh, four one thousandths of an inch in size. There are amoeba bigger than I was, but I have plants. And I grew into a human with uh, about 30 trillion human cells in my body and about 40 trillion microbial cells from this huge array of bacteria and a similar type of organism called archaea, category of critters, um, single-celled yeast, protozoans, and one-celled animals, as they're called. And they're in me, they're on me. They help me digest food that I can't digest by myself. They produce vitamins that I can't create enough of my, in, through my own diet. 
they are guarding against harm, more harmful bacteria and other single-celled microbes. Um, they are producing hormones that are either identical or very similar to ones that control our moods and thoughts. And a lot of, in medicine, they're beginning to look at, it was a lot more talk these days about our microbiome, right? Taking care of it and the balance of it. And it's basically the biggest gland in our body. And it's also the real engine of our immune system in many ways. So that's us. That's who we are. It, I have 23,000 human genes and the array of different microbe species, thousands of different species inside me and on my skin and pretty much everywhere, um, have 8 million different genes. And they're all operating and doing something. And it's a huge frontier of, of discovery in microbiology and molecular biology and medicine. So, oh, forgot. Every one of my 30 trillion human cells has is fueled by, and the metabolism of my whole body is fueled by these little organelles called mitochondria. And I apologize if, you know, I like to get geeky, but I apologize if this sounds like bio 101, but I have to bring this out because every one of my cells has them anywhere from a few to up to 2,000 inactive cells like those in the human liver. And all of them are modified ancient bacteria. So, um, <laughs> uh, so that's the partnership. That's a joint venture, that's a collaboration, and it's what's termed a symbiosis. And I think a lot of people know that word, but some may not be too familiar with it. And it turns out that it's pretty much everywhere you look in nature, symbiosis, partnerships, connections, collaborations. So coral has built much of the world. I can walk around in places here in the Rocky Mountains and look at coral reefs that are 10,000 feet up in the sky and form a stone. Um, but it's a collaboration between um, a polyp, like an anemone, and algae. Turns out it also includes bacteria that help digest the zooplankton the polyp eats and bacteria that, like the algae, perform photosynthesis. And so it's a group of symbionts. But the, the symbiosis most people would know about in nature is the lichen, which was thought to be a plant and classified that way until someone finally showed that it's a partnership between fungus, which extracts nutrients from everything from stone to soil to wood and algae that produce uh, food from, the, you know, converting sunlight into starch and sugars. And it covers 6% of the world. And we see it in our daily lives. And so this is what is a symbiosis It's not a individual organism. It's a community of organisms because it also includes various bacteria and other microbes that are uh, in partnership with the algae and the fungus. So let's take something more familiar. Um, you can take a tree. Uh, you can take any shrub you can see, almost any wildflower you can see, and we call this the plant. But underneath, covering much more ground um, are what's called mycorrhizal fungi. These are invisible filaments of fungus that if you take a handful of soil out in your yard, you would be holding hundreds to a couple thousand miles of these things. And they are permeating the soil. If you took all the mycorrhizae in the top 
say, five inches of soil around the world and put them end to end, they would extend across our galaxy. That's how pervasive they are. And they are bringing water, scarce water, nutrients, minerals to the tree through its root hairs in return for a bit of starch and sugar produced by the what we call the plant. And almost every plant we know has this relationship. It's universal. Plus, one more symbiont in this, and that is in each green cell of the green vegetation we look at, the basis of the food chain, photosynthesis, doing the work of converting sunlight to food, uh, are chloroplasts. And it turns out that chloroplasts, and they only found this a couple of decades ago, chloroplasts are also modified ancient bacteria. They're called cyanobacteria. People used to call them blue-green algae. And they basically invented photosynthesis. They were the most abundant organism in the world in the early days. This would have been 2 billion years ago. And through their, um, their chemistry, they changed our atmosphere from one dominated by methane, methane and carbon dioxide and sulfur compounds to one filled with oxygen. So I like to pause when I'm up at high altitude in the Rockies, I pause and give thanks to the cyanobacteria. And um, so you've got symbionts within symbionts within symbionts. What does that mean? Well, science calls it a holobiont, a sum greater, I mean, a whole greater than the sum of its parts, but it's a community of partnerships. And that defines us as well as virtually every other organism. There is no such thing as an individual species above the level of bacteria and archaea. They are all partnered with somebody and often with a whole lot of somebodies. So. And I'm going to quit looking at my paper and just proceed to the kind of place we think of as wildlife heaven. This is East Africa. It produces all this biomass out there of great, inspiring, majestic, wild, big animals, megafauna. And the question partly is how it does this. Because this is a landscape subject to periodic drought, a tough country, often very dry. How does it century after century yield this kind of spectacle? And the answer, I won't go, I'll, I'll quit geeking out here, but it has to do a lot with the fact that 80% of the biomass of those grasses out there is underground. And a good part of that is their fungal partners. So able to extract every last bit of nutrition from a huge area underground that we can't see. But it, we focus on the big guys. I mean, I, I certainly do. I can relate to elephants really easily because they're very expressive. They have wonderful societies, very altruistic, take care of one another. Um, they've got a language, some of which is subsonic. They communicate in rumbles we don't hear, but can feel in our bones. And they're, they're just marvelous critters. But what we all know, elephants have had a tough time surviving. They're simply running out of room, both in Asia and in Africa. Um, and their numbers are way down from 50 to 100 million to a few hundred thousand here and there. Um, and what I keep thinking, okay, what if we lose, I don't want to live in a world without the likes of these giants. But I'm also really intrigued by the fact that with all that body mass, imagine how many trillions or quadrillions of cells they have in their body. They almost never get cancer. So what do we have to learn from them? And of course, that brings up the question of all the ways we're able now to borrow from the genetics of other species from our relatives 
um, for medicine, for, you know, for building new structures, for all the, every animal out there is a, is a right answer to the question of how best to live on the planet in some niche. And boy, there's so, I mean, you know, this is getting rid of so many animals so fast as we're doing in our age is burning the libraries of information. So, you know, the barbarians at the gate. Um, also, these guys uh, have a brain three times the size of ours. So uh, let's wait until artificial intelligence helps us learn to communicate with them, find out what they're thinking before we decide <laughs> uh, that we can maybe do without elephants. But um, remember the biomass out on the savanna? It turns out that the termites in East Africa outweigh all the big animals together. So these are almost, you know, almost invisible guys. Um, some of the termites, like these mega termites, they call them, that build the mounds, um, they, we all know they eat wood, right? And they eat dried grasses. They, they recycle the dead vegetation and put that nutrition into the soil for all the, the, the plants to use as a fertilizer. But how do they do it? Because the termites themselves don't digest all that. These ones eat everything, turn it into piles of mulch, put the mulch inside their uh, their skyscrapers here, their condos, and then they farm fungus on it. They cultivate a fungus and let the fungus do the digestion, a symbiotic fungus. And the ants contribute a symbiotic bacteria that it contains that is keeping away the other kinds of fungus and other kinds of um, moles or or uh, bacteria that would destroy the, the farmland. So they're using their own kind of biocontrol, which uh, anyway, it's pretty incredible. But the other thing that interests me is is the other there's an, another group of termites that doesn't cultivate fungus, but they digest wood. But it turns out it's protozoans in their gut that do the digestion. And then a couple of years ago, someone found out it's actually bacteria living on the cell walls of the protozoans that contribute the important enzymes so that these guys can go ahead and eat your house or your hut. Um, so I think that's enough bio here, but the reason I'm bringing this up and how we perceive nature is that I think humans have a tendency to put things into categories, uh, separate categories from one another. And that's easier for us to remember them and to analyze them and deal with it. But it turns out what nature is doing is more of a synthesis and an analysis. It's putting different organisms together, including us, that's what gives us our vitality. That's what makes ecosystems go. And again, I want to bust down those barriers we've set up mentally between us and the rest of nature, because if we're going to save nature, we have to start valuing it a whole different way. You can't save what you don't love, and you can't love what you don't understand. And we've got a lot of work ahead of us. And this is a chart from the book that simply shows that since Homo sapiens arose about uh, 300 to 350,000 years ago, uh, we went to 12,000 years ago and our human population on the planet never exceeded a million. We're now producing about 70 million new people every year. Um, and we went from, uh, well, you can see the chart, but it's sheer skyrocket. It's just, we've gone viral and we've got more than 8 billion of us today. So the impact 
is on the uh, on the left is a chart showing the vertebrates species um, and their numbers in 1970, well, just in the last half century to recently. And where there were 10 animals, there are now three. We have lost a huge percentage. And when we look at the living weight of land-dwelling mammals in the circles on the right, um, since just 1900, and there had already been a lot of reduction, uh, here's here are the color schemes. The blue is the living weight of all the humans on Earth. The gray or whatever <laughs> that is, the big section, that's our livestock. And the green section is all the land-dwelling wild mammals that still exist on the planet. This is about 4% of the chart. So I think we've got a more idealized view of nature. We watch the wildlife specials and tend to think there's a lot more wildlife out there than there is. And it's hard to get a gut sense of how fast all this is disappearing. But I, I feel it strongly because I work in places like Af Africa and Asia with exploding populations. And there simply is no room left for the big needy critters like big cats and elephants and orangutans and that sort of thing. It's going to be a palm oil plantation instead of an orangutan forest. Um, the people have eaten all the wild game, so the big cats come in and start killing the livestock, and then they go because they get killed off. So it uh, it's a super challenge, and again, it's going to depend on how we value these animals and how we understand them if we're going to make change in time. So now I want to talk about what's going right, OK? Um, no more doom and gloom. This is our North American continent. Historically, the hot colors show where the big meat eaters and the big plant eaters, different species, were most abundant and where we had the greatest diversity of them. And it's in the Rocky Mountains because we've got all these different elevations and all kinds of different habitats, for one thing. And if we look over at the current um, distribution, you can see it has kind of shrunk to the Rocky Mountain region. And more so in, in more of it in Canada and the US, but what what's left comes down into our lower 48, Montana and Idaho, and where Vital Ground and other groups are focusing. Um, the black outlines a conservation initiative called the Yellowstone to Yukon initiative, which is 2,000 miles from north to south. And here it is uh, in a closer view. The idea is to connect these strongholds, as Matt was talking about, and give animals the freedom to roam, to adjust to changing climates, to exchange genes, to adapt to different situations, and also not to be vulnerable to whatever comes through a particular uh, park, if wildfires or floods or drought or insect outbreaks for a disease epidemic. This is why about 80% of the known extinctions on the planet have taken place on islands in the ocean because they're vulnerable. And our park system and what we traditionally think about as conservation is setting aside these islands, these preserves, and strictly protecting them. But it's not going to hold up over time between inbreeding and those other effects. They've got to have the freedom to roam and intermingle. That's how nature works over time. Grizzly bears did not arise in one of these little islands on, you know, say on the left. They arose in this eco region. And if we're going to keep them, we've got to keep that vibrant somehow. Here's uh, so movement of animals, animals is critical. And here's a bear trying to get across Interstate 90 in Montana. 
in two different years trying to get from uh, probably the uh, Northern Continental Divide ecosystem around Glacier Park down towards Yellowstone, which is ice, whose bears are isolated there now. And you can see, it just kept bouncing off that highway. Bears do not like highways and mother bears with young almost never cross them. And I think our job is to protect things on a big scale and then protect them on a smaller scale. And again, Matt mentioned highway crossings. So this is a pedestrian walkway for four-legged pedestrians in Banff National Park, and it works really well. And they've document they put up cameras. You can also do it through culverts under the roads and put a camera in there. You'll find everybody crossing that from turtles to mountain lions to grizzly bears. So and this is the vital ground connectivity strategy because you give animals multiple pathways so they don't get confined to one particular area, but this is based on the best habitats and the least disturbance within them and that sort of thing, and it works. Um, grizzly bears are recovering a bit in Yellowstone and in the Northern Continental Divide on the uh, upper right-hand part, the gray. And we need to get them back in Idaho and North Cascades. And then we'll have, if they're connected, then we can finally relax and say, I think we have recovered a threatened species. But if we just do it island by island and they're not connected and that's all developed in between, that's not a good long-term solution. So the last subject I want to get at, again, on how we think of ourselves and what our relationship with nature is or ought to be, is uh, the medical, I, I got carried away reading the medical literature on contact with nature. It's the reason going back a long time, doctors have always said, you need to, you need to just take a vacation, get outdoors. And now doctors are actually prescribing more time outdoors for people. And in Canada, the government, uh, the national parks gave out free passes to uh, doctors to give to patients to the national parks. Because study after study shows that when you go into a natural space, a green space especially, um, your blood pressure drops, your heart rate slows, your immune system gets strengthened, and your cognitive abilities clear up. And this is your parasympathetic nervous system, which is rest and relaxation operating. The opposite is your sympathetic system, which is your fight or flight. Be alert, be aware, watch out. And that balance is, we had a, a natural one. We evolved as, as primates for millions of years in natural settings. And that balance was a good one. Now, uh, the average American spends about 90% of his or her life indoors. And even more if you add the time uh, it confined within transportation, automobiles and trains. It's out of whack. That causes stress. That means we're, we're putting out hormones um, like adrenaline and, and cortisol and stuff. And anyway, it's it leads to, they've connected this to diabetes, to um, heart problems, to all kinds of things. But the Fundamental finding is that people who are more frequently in contact with nature are healthier, markedly healthier, and they live longer. They've even pinned uh, increased longevity to the number of trees in neighborhoods. Um, no one can explain exactly how this works, but I think it's one of the best things about if you're trying to get someone to get engaged in conservation, you want to go out and criticize them, make them feel guilty, uh, <laughs> uh, get up on your on your preacher stump and and uh, talk about 
you know, how can you not see this? Just say, would you like to be happier, healthier, and live longer? Here's a suggestion. Go to Walden Wood, walk around, right? Um, so anyway, that's a connection to nature. We're still defining, but it's a very, very critical and important one. And I think a great wonder and a real joy that, that's uh, waiting there for us. So to wrap it up, I'd say try a, what I call a, a new golden rule for our age, and that's do unto ecosystems as you would have them do unto you. Nurture, sustain health, allow to flourish. And I know you can probably all read this yourself, but I'll just say being one with nature sounds like an aspiration. It really isn't because we already are. So my final thing, I found a quote in the American Transcendental Web. Um, I've seen reading about, uh, it's, it's a paper called Mountaintops and Riverbanks as Pulpits, a Transcendentalist, a Transcendental Return to Nature. But as you know, the Transcendentalists were opposed to the rational scientific approach to nature which mostly consisted of an objectification of the natural world. Nature was looked at as something to be studied first and enjoyed second. The transcendentalists revered nature in a divine sense. Nature was not subordinate to them, but instead nature was the other part of a symbiotic relationship. So you can see why I picked this, because I'm a symbiosis fan. Um, but they wanted in, a, in an age, the early industrial age, um, when America seemed keen on, you know, cutting down everything, plowing it up, no holes barred. And the transcendentalists were, in addition to this foresighted uh, view of, of the status of women and, and opposition to slavery and improving human rights, um, they wanted to get away from, you know, the the harsher, uh, overbearing kinds of religion and and the mechanistic view of the world. And I mean, to me, that that was a tremendous influence in in American thought, and it was certainly an influence of mine. And so, I, you know, I take my hat off to the work you're doing at Walden Woods because we need to remember this. And we need to tie that together with the uh, the modern findings coming from science, saying that look, we're we couldn't be any more involved with and interwoven with nature if we tried, um, given all the, the way our bodies work. And and so um, let's rethink that and see where it leads. And redefine what it means to be human and stop you know keeping that wall between us so so we can self-congratulate ourselves on how special we are but keep all the rest of nature apart and treat it as a commodity so i'll i'll quit um i'll quit lecturing there <laughs> before i get too wound up but um, no thank, thank you so much doug um thank you for that wonderful presentation and it just occurred to me the thorough quote, which you probably heard, but we are part and parcel of nature. We could have, you know, named your presentation that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'll I'll jump right into it with questions because we have some rolling in. Um, so the first one, your suggestion to look at the overlaps and symbiosis between species is profoundly confirming and humbling. Do you think there is a balance we should aim to strike between relating to the natural world? and distinguishing ourselves from it. Thinking of Timothy Treadwell and Werner Herzog's Grizzly Man documentary, who wanted to become one with grizzlies and was ultimately killed by one. So jumping right into the, uh, you know, hard question. <laughs> well, old, old Timothy became one with the grizzly, um, not the way he had imagined, but um, what I, I think, you know, transcendentalism comes from a romantic tradition of nature you know, with philosophers in, in, in Europe. 
and the transcendentalists also, uh, I think, were drawing from early explorations for the West Westerners of um, Eastern philosophy, Taoist and Hindu and other influences. But, you know, saying that we are embedded within nature and it's embedded with, within us, and we are one with nature, it doesn't mean it's all cuddly. It doesn't mean that you know, a lot of creatures out there are very expert at eating other creatures alive. And, and you know, we, we, the romantic part is, um, that's another human invention that makes us feel good, makes certain people feel good, just as demeaning other animals and calling them all beasts and brutes or way dumber than we are. I mean, a sperm whale has a brain six times the size of ours. And it's got a highly convoluted cerebral cortex, which is where thinking occurs. And there are guys using AI to see if they can speak with sperm whales. Um, I just say the reason, we've got all kinds of reasons to keep these other creatures because they are, like I say, a, a two, million, two billion year old collection of successful experiments. I mean, they're here because whatever it is they're doing, whatever capabilities and traits and specialties they have gave them a leg up. It was survival of the fittest. And what can we draw from for medicine, for, for architecture, for uh, who knows what else? If, um, but I, I, I'm not urging anyone to go out and make, make friends with the first bear they see. So... Um, I have had grizzlies been so close that they brushed against me. This is a salmon stream, but I didn't go and, you know, then follow it and lie down on it, you know, put my head on his tummy and sing songs to it like Timothy did. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, Matt might want to weigh in on that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Resolutely not. Huh? Okay. Oh, no, I, I can chime in. Um... No, I, th I, I think you hit the nail on the head, Doug, in the idea that uh, being interconnected and being a part of nature does not mean abandoning reason. Um, and um, yeah, I think we actually uh, have a lot um, we can do to leave animals space and and practice coexistence um in out of respect for the animals um you know loving nature sometimes actually means keeping your distance um if that's going to help the animals survive um yeah. well i and i wanted to add that you know i'm talking about wild country often and these studies uh, done on the value of the benefits you get from immersion in nature, um, it seems that they work as well in an urban park as, well, it's hard to say. I mean, this is all new a new field, but um, it can be as simple as viewing beautiful landscapes. Um, so I... You know, I tell people, well, they say, what can, what can I do? Um, you can fight for wilderness. You can try to protect uh, big wildlife communities like we do at Vital Ground. But you can also go uh, make sure there's a little green space or urban park uh, in your neighborhood. You know, and where kids can play and explore and just be around green growing things. It, it just seems to work. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I, I, you know, maybe maybe focusing on grizzly bears is not the best way. But I got to say, I've met a lot of grizzly bears, and every time you generalize about them, you're you're wrong for a lot of bears because they're highly individual, and that comes from being a smart, adaptable, long-lived critter. Different personalities, different traits, and different things they've learned. Sorry, just making a note. 
Um, okay, next question. I live in Wyoming where there are a lot of hunters who claim that they are also conservationists. And I may be wrong, but I just don't buy it partly because of their equipment and vehicles use up resources. What would you recommend my response should be to a hunter who claims they are saving wildlife and or their habitats? I'd say there's some truth to that. Um, there's certainly been a lot of abuses where, you know, we tend to try to get away with the maximum harvest that we can, and that's not always the best thing. It also causes some genetic changes if you're just shooting trophy elk or, you know, that's the big majestic animals that are the fittest. Um, so there's a lot to argue about there and discuss, but um, I'd say a large portion of the hunting community uh, does understand the value of protecting habitats and have been allies with conservation efforts to keep open spaces, to keep um, healthy environments out. Because again, if it's, if it's good enough for those critters and good enough for, you know, hunters to uh, use, I'm not, I, I'm not personally defending hunting. I don't, you know, I've spent too much time watching animals to get that much of a thrill out of it, but I'm also uh, fat enough as it is. I don't need to eat anymore. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I'd say that's, a, that's always been a tough question because there's, as in any uh, group, there's everything from slob hunters to, to uh, you know, who are just, just there to take, to people who are actively out uh, uh, working for the protection of, of a variety of animals. So um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. And, and when it comes to, yeah, they're using vehicles and all, um, burning gas and all that well then then i gotta look at my own life and say what am i doing i'm running around to meetings to talk about the environment on jet planes so um I, i'm not gonna say any more about that that's a good answer uh, next question what role does human population control play in protecting biodiversity and reducing extinction Matt, over to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it's a it's yeah. a slippery slope to throwing around that phrase. Um, and I I think I, I much prefer phrases like education and uh, um female education in the developing world to get more specific. Um, but I think uh, the um, the problem is, is very complex. Doug's graph doesn't lie <laughs> in terms of the kaboom of population explosion. Um, and I think um, it's, um, yeah, it's gonna, um, in the, in the developed world, I think there, there already is, uh, a so sizable movement to, you know, make more responsible choices in terms of, uh, how many children people have all that. So I, I think you're, you're, you're leading towards something, which is that the statistics show pretty clearly that where there are more human rights and women have more an improved status, a more equal status and education, the birth rate goes down. So, I mean, the, the cure is, you know, partly economic and social. And I think when we talk about population control, I can understand why you know we people are reluctant to dive into that because uh, you think of the top-down government demanded population control efforts that were in India and China. And I don't think you're going to sell that in very many democracies. 
um, but you you figure out what what works to so women don't have to have eight children because four of them die and and they need more more hands on the farm. Um, so I the prognosis is it's going to level off somewhere around 12, 12 billion, 11 or 12 billion. And that may be wishful thinking, but um, something does have to happen. I'm not, I don't think I'm qualified to speak about it. I can, I just know that I've been in places where they're literally running out of room. All, all the, oh my gosh, I'm thinking of places like Borneo and, and, uh, uh, portions of Africa where you're trying to build connections between wildlife populations and you wait two years and go back and look again at what the possibilities are and there are 50,000 more people squatting in the corridor that you had planned for the wild animals and you know obviously this is, is not going to hold up but mm -hmm. I think we need to think about our incentives rather than um, disincentives for having more children because that's how human nature seems to work. So, um, it's, and I did want to point out India has always amazed me. I've worked there a bit and on tigers and on elephants and on other things, but uh, there are, I think everyone knows India is pretty darn crowded. I think it's got the highest population of all now exceeds China. And yet it's got fabulous wildlife areas. Yeah. Why is that? Yeah. It's because I mentioned the transcendentalists reading Eastern philosophies. And it's because they don't distinguish humans from the rest of the creatures. Um, in that there's a belief that, you know, there's a soul common to all all living things. And then in addition to that, they have Ganesh, the elephant-headed god. Um, the Buddhists have Avalokiteshvara, who is a bodhisattva, who earned his way to Nirvana, Nirvana, whatever that you know looks like. But he didn't want to go until he could bring the animals with him. And it's just a different way of looking at life. And they don't feel that they they own all the earth that it was naturally given to them and no other animal. And here in Montana, if you talk to the Blackfeet, say, or the Salish Kootenai tribes, they'll talk about the circle of life. They don't talk about a pyramid, which is kind of what we like with humans on the tip top and a golden uh, throne. And then all the rest of these things are lesser creatures. And that makes all the difference. So. Yeah. So last question, because I want to be mindful of everyone's time. Uh, what's a generalization about grizzlies that's inaccurate that you found? Wow. Um, if there are any. Oh, no, there are too many. That's why I'm puzzled. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I think it's the one we apply to a lot of big scary critters, and that's that they um, they're driven by food and sex. You know, they're they're instinctual. They want to mate. They want to eat and compete. And all I that generalization, I mean, applies to wolverines, to, for a lot of people, to cougars, to lions, tigers, so on. And you watch these animals, let's, let's take, go back to grizzlies again. They're one of the most playful critters I've ever seen because they are big and dominant. And a grizzly doesn't have to worry about who's sneaking up on it, right? And so they can goof off. They're very inquisitive, they're curious. They're out exploring things. They're investigating it. Um, they they just, I don't know. I remember watching a grizzly lying on its back and juggling a log at the edge of a lake. And then it went into the lake 
and would put his head down and start blowing bubbles and the bubbles would linger on the surface because there was a film of pollen and it would go around and prick him with those four inch long claws. Go, whoa, this, this is cool. Oh, but there's another one. Ah. <laughs> you know, so I just say the generalization that they are one thing or another or that they they have that they're primarily instinctual. No, they're they're what they're born to be and they're what they've learned to be. And that includes what people are inadvertently teaching them, like, oh yeah, there are young sheep left out in a pen undefended in the spring. Or, oh yeah, um, you can get apples at my house because I don't pick them early to prevent you from coming into town and getting killed. Mm -hmm. uh, or I, you know, I hang my uh I just throw my garbage out wherever I feel and and then I'm horrified when it turns out bears are coming into my yard. So um I don't know. It's hard to I like animals that are really hard to define because it gets at their complexity and grizzlies certainly right up up near the top of the list. Yeah. Yeah. Well I think that's a a great place to end it. Um Thank you so much, Doug and Matt, for taking the time to be with us tonight. Um, for everyone at home, this is being recorded and we will have it on our website in the next couple of days. So if you know anyone who missed it, um, we can share the link. If you wanna watch it again, feel free to do so in a couple of days. Um, just, just to end, the WWP has a lot of upcoming fall events. You can uh, find those on our website at walden.org. I put that link in the chat. And lastly, uh, Vital Ground and the Walden Woods Project are nonprofits uh, who have been hosting our events um, mostly for free. So if anyone wants or is able to, to donate, we encourage you to do so to Vital Ground tonight, um, whose generosity and work we so appreciate. And I'll put that link also in the chat anyone feels moved to do so. But um, other than that, thank you so much, Doug and Matt and Zoe. <laughs> um, thanks for your help tonight. And yeah, look forward to seeing you again. Hopefully maybe we'll take a take a trip out there. It sounds sounds like you live in a really great, great place. Well, I'll be glad to take take a hike on any excuse into the good country. So yeah. Yeah. Give a holler <laughs> and come on back. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Uh, yep, yeah, thank you all. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.